I wanted to definitely ask, you know, given you you highlighted that double standard with the prisoners of war language versus kidnapping, which definitely well noted, especially since al Qassam was warning that this, the you know, these tactics, right? Uh, they're very strategic. They're warning that, hey, Israel, if you if you're going to bomb us and raid raise us, uh, you're going to also potentially uh, be killing your quote unquote your own. Uh, at the same time. I wanted to ask you because these these tactics they feel like I don't know if you've ever read the book I Die in Colonialism by Franz Fanon, mm -hmm. Algeria like the Algerian struggle and the guerrilla warfare tactics and I think a lot of people looking at this see it you just mentioned the support that the resistance has with the Palestinian people you know when people look at this from the outside they think well warfare is like tanks and guns and weapons and armies clashing and but here when when you have this colonial situation it's it it doesn't take that form necessarily even though you do have this incredible uh, open now open air resistance that is massive but obviously built up and coordinated and i wanted to ask talk about the conditions that then leads to this because uh, people don't join resistance and don't, don't end up conducting guerrilla warfare unless they are indeed and occupied and oppressed people. So can you talk about the conditions in Gaza, what leads to these tactics with these strategies, so people can understand that there is no both sides in this thing, because I see that a lot. There's a lot of that going around. A lot of, the, oh, well, look at all these unverified videos of people, of so-called Israeli civilians being uh, tortured and in the streets and all of this. Talk about the conditions that the Palestinian people have had to live through in Gaza and, and, and broader Palestine under Israeli uh, colonialism. Well, Israel is a settler colony, and it only exists because the vast majority of the indigenous Palestinian people were brutally ethnically cleansed from their towns and villages in 1948. And, and Gaza exists because of that. What we know today is the Gaza Strip. Of course, there was always an ancient city called Gaza going back to ancient times. But what we call the Gaza Strip is a result of the uh, 1948 ethnic cleansing and partition of Palestine. So today you have more than two, and a, two million people in Gaza. 50% of them are children. And uh, two thirds of them are refugees from uh, lands uh, from towns and villages that are in the area around Gaza. Many of them can see their former homes from, you know, over the the Gaza fence. And many of these Israeli colonies, which we always hear about, like Sderot and Ofakim and uh, all of the Kisufim and all of these, uh, are built on uh, ethnically cleansed Palestinian villages and lands of people who are now in Gaza. The, the city of Ashkelon, the Israeli city of Ashkelon, was the Palestinian in city of uh, Majd al Asqalan. And by the way, the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians from uh, Majd al took place in 1950. I mean, Israel was created, most of the ethnic cleansing was in 1948, but even up to 1950, Israel was putting Palestinians on trucks, literally, and sending them to Gaza and stealing their land. And so Gaza is a massive open air prison. It is a ghetto in every sense of the word. It is where Israel puts surplus Palestinians solely and exclusively because they're not Jewish. And so their existence as non-Jews on their own land threatens Israel's so-called Jewish character. This is why Israel Zionism is a fundamentally racist project. And since uh, and from 1967, when Israel occupied Gaza, it started putting settlers in Gaza. So until the year 2005, 40% of Gaza's land, 40% of it, this is a tiny area, it's about the size of Washington, D.C., 40% uh, of Gaza's land was reserved for about 6,000 Israeli settlers. And the other one and a half million at the time, one million, one and a half million Palestinians, were on 60% of the land. And the settlers got the beaches. They got most of the seafront. So you had the settler-only seafront and beaches. You had the settler-only roads. 
Gaza was divided north to south and often cut off. It was a it was a prison. Then in 2005, due to the resistance, the Israelis decided that they could no longer hold on to Gaza. It was too costly. So they decided to not end the occupation of Gaza, but change the occupation of Gaza. They pulled the settlers out of Gaza and they placed Gaza under siege. They simply moved the occupation to the perimeter, but they didn't never ended their control of Gaza. They never allowed Palestinians in Gaza to live freely or to come and go as they wished. And then in 2006, there was a Palestinian election. This was the first Palestinian legislative election in, you know, that, that had been held in, in quite a while that Israel finally allowed. And Hamas won. And after Hamas won, instead of respecting the result of the election and allowing Hamas to pursue a political path and see what would unfold, new political possibilities could unfold, Israel, with the full support of the United States and the Europeans and their Arab client regimes in the region, imposed an even tighter siege on Gaza. And from 2006, 2007 onwards, Gaza has been an open-air prison. And I traveled to Gaza 10 years ago. It's the only time I was able to go to Gaza. This was in May of 2013. And it was, I went through Egypt when it was a little bit easier because uh, President Mohamed Morsi had not yet been overthrown and murdered by the Sisi regime uh, that is now in power. Uh, and uh, we were able to get into Gaza. I was with a, a, a delegation. I spent a week there. And uh, it was extraordinary because even in that week, I was able to see so much. And one of the incredible things I saw was the tunnels. We were given permission to go down into the tunnels that existed at the time because of the Israeli siege. There were so many basic needs that were basic goods that were unavailable in Gaza. So Palestinians dug tunnels under the border with Egypt. And uh, Egypt later destroyed them because, you know, they were doing the bidding of Israel and the United States. I don't know if any of the tunnels on the Egyptian side, side still exist. It's possible that some have come back. But at the time, there were a lot of tunnels. And we went into a tunnel that I just want to describe for a second because it was there was a vertical shaft with a platform that was a circular steel platform that was, I would say, large enough to park two cars on. This was a big circular platform. And the, the platform went up and down. So there was like a rail system. And you went in at the top, and then the platform went down vertically about, I don't know, 100 feet or so underground. And then there was a horizontal tunnel that went into Egypt that was deep underground and that was um, wide enough to drive a car through. And there was electricity and there was uh, lighting. And it was stunning. I mean, the, the engineering of this thing was incredible. It was so impressive. And this was a goods tunnel that we were allowed to see. So this was not a military tunnel. We were not taken to any of the resistance facilities underground. But just seeing that, I can only imagine the scale of the deep underground facilities that the resistance has built in Gaza. Deep underground, sophisticated, extensive, that must exist and that Israel could never reach. I don't think there's any way that Israel, if it invades Gaza by ground now, will be able to reach that network to any extent. And so the, the, the sophistication of the resistance has developed by necessity, by the conditions that the occupier, the colonizer, has imposed on Palestinians. And that's just Gaza, which after all is just two or three percent of the territory of historic Palestine. In the West Bank, we have a situation where uh, you have 
more and more Israeli settlers, whereas they took the settlers out of Gaza, there are more and more in the West Bank. And you have now a, a resurgence. Uh, for, for many years, Israel has managed to suppress a lot of the armed resistance in the West Bank because of the collaboration of the Palestinian Authority, which is an Israeli-American proxy force. It's armed and trained and funded by the United States uh, with the permission of Israel and the Europeans in order to, to police and repress the Palestinians on behalf of Israel. So the PA has, is Israel's, uh, uh, you know, uh, fist against the Palestinian people and their resistance in the West Bank. But over the last months, uh, the PA and Israel have been losing control in the West Bank. And there has been a resurgence of armed resistance there, particularly in the north. And that's why we've seen Israel going in and committing massacre after massacre in places like Jenin and uh, Ahmed Jaber and in uh, other refugee camps and towns in the West Bank in order to try to suppress the resurgent resistance in the West Bank. So there is a situation of growing resistance uh, under a situation of, of raw, brutal settler colonialism, and it's totally unsustainable. There is no military quote unquote solution to this for Israel. There's no technical solution. There's no, if we build higher walls or uh, or uh, come up with some um, technology to detect tunnels. Israel spent billions building what it thought was an impregnable barrier along the border with Gaza that goes, uh, you know, 10 meters in the air and 10 meters underground. And look what the resistance were able to do. So the, these are the conditions in which Palestinians exist and are resisting. And the Israeli settler colony at the same time is in a state of deep uh, political and social crisis where the, the um, sort of, it, it's far beyond the pioneer phase of the early days of Israel when people were more, I mean, if, you know, people, there was more motivation and more willingness to sacrifice for the settler colonial project. These, you know, were uh, hard, uh, settler pioneers who who were determined to establish their colony and willing to do whatever it took. Israel today is a, a spoiled, late capitalist consumer society where, like many other places, a lot of people are interested in you know consumption and iPhones and sneakers and are not that willing to make huge sacrifices. The motivation isn't there. And that's a key difference. Israel may have all of these weapons and all of the support from the United States and all the funding, but they don't have the motivation that the Palestinian resistance has. And that is a massive factor also in uh, the ability of a resistance movement or an anti-colonial movement to prevail is the motivation factor. And uh, so that in a nutshell, are some of the, the conditions, I think, that have brought us to this point. But I think the key thing is the utter refusal of Israel and its international sponsors, principally among them the United States, to countenance any concession, any real concession to Palestinian rights and humanity that has brought things to this point. Israel brought this entirely, entirely on itself. All the violence, all the bloodshed is Israel's fault. Israel and the United States and its other enablers. They did this. It was their choice. Yes, and uh, maybe we could close on the political reaction and some, I guess some military reaction all intertwined. Uh, you, we have the United States, Biden, Blinken all doubling down on support for Israel. There's aircraft carriers and, uh, you know, fighter jets, all kinds of things going to Israel to fortify that uh, crisis that you just described uh, to any significant degree, what's possible. 
Then you also have uh, forces like Elon Omar, and you even have the so-called liberal governments in Europe, the entire European Union, all double down on the narrative of Palestinian atrocities uh, uh, to some form or another. You have the UK now shining Israeli flags, the entire European Union doing the same. You have Vladimir Zelensky, the uh, hero in Ukraine or the zero in Ukraine, maybe we should say. Also come out with multiple statements. Uh, some think he's begging for weapons while also uh, kind of intimating that he supports Israel 100 percent. But we have all these reactions. And then you also have political presidential candidates coming out. You have Cornell West. Some people were angry with his statement in terms of uh, making false equivalencies. RFK Jr. statement, which was full force Israel lobby talking points. Uh, wherever you want to go in terms of your reactions to how politically the fallout has been since uh, Palestine, the Palestinians uh, began this operation, Al-Aqsa flood. Yeah, I think the thing I would emphasize is the extent to which Palestinians just don't care. Uh, and, you know, Ben-Gurion, the uh, founder of the Israeli settler colony, the first prime minister of the a settler colony famously said one time, you know, it, it was, I think, in a cabinet meeting that uh, he was told by some other minister, you know, if we do this, the uh, United Nations will pass a resolution against us. And he said, basically, to hell with the United Nations. What matters is not what the Goyim say, what matters is what the Jews do. And I think there is a a mirror of that in Palestinian thinking. It doesn't matter anymore what the liberal West says or Western progressives say. What matters is what the Palestinian resistance does. Because frankly, all the sympathy, to the extent there's been much at all, from Western liberals has been absolutely worthless in changing the policies of Western governments uh, and changing the conditions of the Palestinian people. And of course, the Western, so-called Western countries are responsible because they are the uh, foundation on which the Israeli settler colony is armed and funded and so on. And I think that there is just a realization that, you know, being the perfect, well-behaved victims has gotten Palestinians nowhere. And the lectures, you know, the disgusting lectures Palestinians have been getting for years, like, Oh, you know, if you if you take inspiration from Gandhi, if you're just more like Gandhi, then the world will listen. I mean, there were horrible columns from Tom Friedman and, and you know, Nick Kristoff and those type of people for years saying that. Well, Palestinians did that. They said, OK, we'll try it. In 2018, the Great March of Return, tens, hundreds of thousands of Palestinian men, women, children, young, old, came out to to protest, to rally for their rights at the Gaza border fence, completely unarmed. And Israel sent military snipers to maim and murder them in their thousands. Was there any reaction? Did the, pro the promised uh, reaction from uh, the, the, the reaction, the support that Tom Friedman and Nick Kristof uh, had promised, did that materialize? No. There was silence. There was complicity. There was support for Israel murdering unarmed civilians with military snipers. Children, across, women. <laughs> yeah. So what do you want Palestinians yeah. to do? And now all the whining and crying. Palestinians don't have time to mourn their dead. The children that are murdered almost every day by the Israeli army across the West Bank, they don't have time to count their own dead. And Western liberals are demanding that they mourn for and sympathize with their colonizers and oppressors. Who else is in that situation? Certainly not Ukrainians, where every day you can read in the New York Times articles praising the plucky Ukrainians for all the ways they found to fight the Russians. Articles praising car bombings of Russian officials, praising the, uh, the, the murders of suspected collaborators. Uh, the articles praising uh, Ukrainians for... Uh, their inventiveness in taking uh, commercial drones and turning them into weapons and so on. Where is all that for the Palestinian people? Of course, it doesn't exist. So why the hell should they care what Ilhan Omar or Cornel West or Robert F. Kennedy or any of these other clowns think? Because 
their support, to the extent that it's ever come, has added up to zero. That's the reality. And so I haven't seen a single Palestinian or a single commentator in Arab media say, oh, well, what are they saying in the West? What, what, what is Ilhan Omar saying? Nobody cares. Get over yourselves. Nobody cares. Yeah, indeed. And then final, final, final point uh, in terms of the world political fallout outside of the West. I'm wondering your thoughts on, you know, I feel like we were almost days away from a so-called Saudi-Israel normalization. There were reports that Saudi Arabia was about to increase its oil production to lower prices for the U.S. for some kind of defense pact. This was Biden's signature achievement or supposed to be a signature foreign policy achievement going into the election. That seems all but dead. There's supposed to be a corridor, the G20 announced, that's supposed to run through the region. And of course, we have, uh, uh, you know, the difference between how Russia and China has responded to this conflict versus the West, where the West has all doubled down on Israel's side with aid, with all of this virtue signaling and Russia and China, of course, calling for peace. What has been your reaction to the global fallout outside of the West, outside of the collective West? The uh, what was the first part of your question? There was uh, uh, Saudi Arabia yeah, uh, and the, Israel right. were supposed yeah, to normalize. That was in important. the works. I want to comment on that. Um, the the fantasy of the Saudi-Israeli normalization, as with the others, at least on the Israeli side, is that once we have normalization with all the Arab regimes, the Palestinian issue just goes away. It becomes irrelevant. The party goes on. And that's obviously untrue, but the momentous historic events of the 7th of October 2023 should put an end to that fantasy once and for all. Does that mean that the normalization with the Saudis won't go ahead? I, I think it may be delayed, but it probably will go ahead. But the point is, it doesn't change anything fundamental. It doesn't change the reality that Israel is a minority settler colony sitting on the volcano of a majority indigenous people that will not rest until they have their liberation and freedom. And no blessing from any Arab tyrant, any Arab client of the United States for Israel will change that reality. That's the message that uh, has to be seared into the minds of Israelis and their sponsors. As for the wider world, I mean, I'm not naive about this. Russia has always been uh, quite pro-Israel in many ways. Uh, and um, so to that extent, I was, uh, I'd say, pleasantly surprised that the Russian government position was uh, much better than I expected it would be in this circumstance. And I think, uh, and that goes for China too, they got closer to talking about the fundamentals, is that Basically, the politics of condemnation gets you nowhere, doesn't change the reality. It's just virtue signaling. Uh, if you want to end this horrific and escalating violence, and it will escalate further, uh, then you have to deal with the root issues of it, which is the utter dispossession of the Palestinian people and the, the complete denial of their rights, especially their right to self-determination. And... Uh, that, I think, uh, is widely understood across the world. It is the bubble, the isolated uh, United States and the isolated so-called West uh, where that is not understood. And, uh, and among its elites, because among the people, it's well understood. It's widely understood in Europe and even in the United States, uh, the, the depth of understanding among ordinary people is is far greater than it used to be. So Israel and its supporters are actually quite isolated, even though they try to make it look as if the, the world, quote unquote, world is on their side. No, it isn't. The world understands that Israel is an apartheid settler colony and its time is limited. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I appreciate all of your support. This channel, however, needs your help. 
I am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you so much and I look forward to the next video.